Welcome to worship at Journey Presbyterian Church in Folsom, California. We're here in the sanctuary. It's a, it's a space I haven't visited in several months due to the pandemic. It feels a little empty. So I'm very glad you're here with me. I'm Kristen Saldine. I'm the interim pastor at Journey. And Pastor Bob Azarito invited me to record this service for you, our neighbors and our friends at Sierra Vista Church in Sacramento. So to all who are watching, Sierra Vista, Journey, whomever, welcome in. Let's join together in our call to worship. God answers when we call. God sets us free when we are hard pressed. The Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I cry out, the Lord hears me. When others say, oh, that we might see better times, I stand in awe before the Lord. For you, O oh God, have put gladness in my heart. Only you, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's listen now to our first hymn. A hymn of gathering and praise. Vista Community Church. So great to see you all. Today, there's a lot of ash in the air. A lot of smoke. I can smell it in my nose. And there's a lot of germs in the air too, because we are in a pandemic. So there's just a lot of negative things happening right now. So I wanted to talk to you about how we work through anger. So if you are angry, I will take a deep breath. 
I will calmly walk away. I will count to ten before I speak. I will play music. I know we have a lot of music lovers at our church. I will go on a walk outside. I will close my eyes and think happy thoughts. I will paint a picture. This one's one of my favorites. I will read a book. I will write down why I'm feeling angry. That's a good one. I will let it go. God created us in a special, specific way. He gave us these emotions, the anger, the sadness, the happiness, to elevate our personalities, really. And he gives us those emotions to work through so we can power through and work on ourselves. The message to take away from this is God created these feelings, even the anger, even the hurt, even the sadness. And our feelings are always valid. This morning's scripture is from Acts 8, 26 to 39. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? The Ethiopian eunuch replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself? Or about someone else. Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what I know from Scripture is pretty simple. That as a Christian, my job is to point to God, where I see God active in the world and in others. But also, I'm to listen to God. To listen to one another. To listen to our neighbors 
and listen to the world. Listening's not easy. Usually when we listen, we have an agenda. We, if we hear something from our neighbors, we're thinking ahead of what we can do about it, or we don't really listen to the world. We, we use the world's resources, and we think about how we can get ahead. But listening, deep listening, is something God calls us to do. Not just listening to God, but listening to our neighbors and listening to the world. There's a lot of pain in listening. There's a lot of challenge in listening. Well, I've been listening a lot these past few months. I, I haven't been preaching weekly. I've been doing evening Vesper services here at Journey twice, twice a week on Zoom. But I haven't been writing a sermon every week, which has actually been a blessing because I was given a big task by the presbytery, and it's almost done, but it took all spring and summer. But anyway, when you preach every week, you got to have something to say. And you spend a lot of time listening to your own voice as you study and you write and you rewrite your sermon. But Christians are called to listen to God, to one another, to our neighbors, to the world. And it's such a temptation for preachers not to listen to other voices, not to ignore them actually, but just sort of place them aside for one more Sunday and focus on the voices you know best, the ones in your own congregation. But that's a temptation. It's a bad practice, really, because Christians are called to listen to God, to one another, and to the world. And as soon as you stop listening to other voices other than your own around you, I think you've stopped listening to God. And that's a sin. It's a way of distancing ourselves from God. And when that happens, I can tell you firsthand, preaching suffers, worship suffers, and congregations become insulated and self-serving. So the freedom of not having to preach for a few months every week, I began a practice of weekly deep listening. I listened to podcasts, to government uh, testimonies and hearings. I listened to books on tape, to radio broadcasts, to conversations I overheard in medical offices, gas stations, and supermarkets. Those are about the only three places I've been since March. Medical offices, gas stations, and supermarkets. I thought back over the past year what I've listened to, deeply listened. I listened from beginning to end to the impeachment of the President of the United States in the House of Representatives. And I listened almost from beginning to end to the trial before the Senate. I listened to refugees at the border waiting for asylum hearings. I listened to the cries of children who were separated from their parents. I listened to virologists who started talking in February about this strange virus that was happening in China. But no, they said, it, it won't get here. I listened to the doctors who started treating patients in Seattle and New York City and the Bay Area. And then to the weekly updates from the Center of Disease Control who finally said it has a name, COVID-19. And then I would listen to the daily briefings of the governors of the, the state of California and the state of New York as they rallied resources to fight the pandemic. I listened to heartbreaking stories from emergency rooms. I listened to nurses who were forced to wear garbage bags as protective clothing, who had the courage to hold the hands of the dying so they would not die alone. 
I listened to the angry man at Safeway who thought someone took his picture because he wasn't wearing a mask and he wasn't going to. I listened to the long haulers, people who contracted the virus months ago, but aren't any better, who have strange aches and terrible fatigue. And I try to remember every day in my prayers that a thousand more citizens in the United States died today from COVID-19. And I don't know how many died around the world. And then I listened to the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, to the protest marches that followed in the United States and all around the world. I listened to the protests in Hong Kong. I listened to the ones who were tear gassed in Washington, D.C., to the mothers who sang lullabies to calm the escalations in Portland, to parents who marched with their young children in Gallup, New Mexico. There were voices of African Americans, of Native Americans, Latinx, transgendered, people who had never been heard before or who were brave enough to raise their voice. I watched the marches in downtown Sacramento and I listened to the building supervisor who told me the only reason the windows of his building weren't broken in the ruckus that would happen in the evening after the riot, after the marchers left and the troublemakers came in. He said the only reason the windows on his building hadn't been broken was because the police used his parking lot to stage uh, their defense. And I listened to police officers, departments of police, sheriffs, trying to cope with a world that had suddenly changed. The rules and the lines had moved, and they were trying to adjust. I listened to school administrators trying valiantly to get school started in the fall, to parents who suddenly valiantly had to find a way to homeschool their kids when the classes couldn't open, to grandparents who valiantly stepped up to do some childcare, and to teenagers who are miserable at home, missing school and their friends. I listened to the Democratic National Convention this week. Next week, I will listen to the Republican National Convention. I listened to the reports of the explosion that decimated Beirut and the news that an anti-corruption dissident in Russia had probably been poisoned. I listened to the concerns of the pastors and church leaders in our presbytery and across the nation facing the challenge of how do you provide worship and pastoral care and education and congregational life during a pandemic to the prayer concerns of congregations I worshiped with virtually on Sunday, to the prayer concerns in our own evening Vesper services here at Journey. I listened to the news of the hurricane season starting in the Gulf of Texas, in the Gulf of Mexico, to my friend in Des Moines who saw houses and roofs ripped apart and ripped open in the wind that struck them last week. And I listened to Cal Fire list 300 fires caused by 11,000 lightning strikes in 72 hours over the weekend. The firefighters and the homeowners and the utility workers, the volunteers. That's just eight months of listening. And I'm not even counting the everyday stuff that happens, the heat waves the shortages, the fear, coping with the virus. And I know it's a long list, but I wanted to tell someone, partly because I've been listening for three months, what a year it's becoming, what a year it might be. I didn't listen passively. Sometimes I would talk back. I would want to explain something, have a teaching moment, clarify a point that I thought someone was saying was wrong. 
I would mutter under my breath, I do not like looters. And when someone called me a racist, I said, I am not a racist. And as soon as I said that, I knew I'd stop listening. And that I just couldn't grasp what that word, systemic racism, meant to those who lived it. And my part in it. It was all a little overwhelming. I think I shared this list with you because once I started writing, I was amazed at what's happened in this year. And it's only August. What's left in the coming year? The election. The struggle to get testing. It's overwhelming. And I started to think, God, if you call me to listen, why does it have to hurt so much? Why is it so scary? And that's when I thought about the Ethiopian eunuch from Acts chapter 8. Because the amazing thing about this story is it's, it's less about Philip teaching this eunuch what he needs to know. It's really about his encounter with a person whose story he, Philip never thought he would encounter. Sure, an Ethiopian, a foreigner, but a eunuch. I was listening to this podcast uh, lately. It's called the Evolving Faith Podcast. It was started by Rachel Held Evans. Some of you know she's a particular hero of mine who passed away unexpectedly last year. It's a podcast for people who've left the church or felt that the church threw them out, who, who feel that they're in a wilderness of spirituality, trying to find their way back to God, trying to find ways to read scripture again, to be able to talk more openly, and to talk about how important it is to change our mind and our faith and our discipleship. And in the podcast yesterday, they talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, about how this Ethiopian actually changes Philip's faith. He's the one who leaves rejoicing. He's the one that's so powerfully changed. They talked about how three things go into this encounter and that these are the three ways that we keep expanding our faith, which I think is so important if we're going to be able to continue listening to God and listening to the world. When we hit those places where it seems too uncomfortable, where the pain is too large, that's when instead of blaming God, we open ourselves up to a new understanding of what faith may mean and the courage to continue. So they were talking about these three things. They said, first, there's travel involved, which I thought was kind of funny, that we change when we travel. And I think he's right. I think the experiences I've had that have changed my life happened when I was traveling, when I was in, when I was in different spaces and places. And I thought about how we're sheltering in place. How do we travel? And I thought about the convention last week when they did the roll call. Maybe you saw it. Instead of this huge crowd cheering and, and big speeches by the states, they actually had video clips of the states. And they had guys holding up calamari from Rhode Island and, and people in Samoa and Hawaii and uh, a native uh, Alaskan up above the Arctic Circle. Louisiana. In Tennessee, they had proud women uh, talking about and celebrating the amendment, the 19th Amendment for women to vote. It had been ratified and passed in Tennessee just a hundred years, not a hundred years ago, would it be a hundred, a hundred years ago this week. And I thought, wow, I have just traveled across the United States. I saw real people. 
I saw a sense of joy and expectation, not about politics, but about participating in something that we were all together. That's, that's how I chose to see it. I traveled that night. I felt connected in a different way than I had. So, what happens when you travel? You engage other people. You have conversations. Philip and this eunuch, as different as people could be, they come together and they have a real conversation. That's the way we expand our faith, by talking to the people whom we disagree with, whom we don't understand, who scare us. And then finally, the Ethiopian unit presses the boundaries. He says, there is a puddle of water. I want to be baptized. Now, if you know the baptismal rites, you don't go get baptized in a puddle. You have a lot of words to say and a lot of things to do, and, and it's got to be done in a certain order. But this eunuch says, there's a puddle of water. I would like to be baptized. And Philip baptizes him. This eunuch pressed the boundaries of one of the, the deepest, most significant rites we have as Christian. Entrance, grafting into the body of Christ. An Ethiopian eunuch joins the chorus of witnesses through a puddle of water. That's amazing. That's God doing something new. When we listen, do we believe that God is going to show up? Do we believe that Jesus Christ is doing something new? Because if we believe that, then we believe that God is here with us and with those we love, but God is also already before us. Christ is already moving forward, inviting us into a faith that is deeper, wider, more inclusive than we could ever imagine. That's something they talk a lot about on the Evolving Faith podcast. I encourage you to give it a listen. Well, I'm going to stop listening so deeply these next few weeks. I'm going to take a little break. Trying, the world seems to be changing so fast, trying to catch up with it and integrate it. Whew. That's kind of tiring. And I'm going to start preaching more. Here at Journey, we're going to be taping services for Sunday mornings starting in September. I won't stop thinking and I won't stop listening. But I hope to bring good news. And I encourage you this week to listen to someone you haven't listened to before or to listen to someone in a new way and to share good news because you believe that God has shown up. We point to God and we listen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. We join together this morning to pray for many concerns. The fires raging here in California, the continuing pandemic, our national election, and the concerns within our own congregations and communities. For the prayers of the people this morning, I would like to lift all those up. 
and also prayers for some folks in our own congregation who've lost loved ones, especially brothers and sisters in the recent weeks. August 23rd is the birthday of my brother, who died about 25 years ago, so I'll be remembering him as well. Bring those you love, gather them here in the circle of prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, you are as vast as the universe, and you are as close as the human heart. This morning we bring to you the concerns of our community and our world. We're grateful that you are with us, and we're confident, as scripture says, that you hear us when we pray. God of earthquake and wind and fire, you tame natural forces that defy control and shock us with their devastation and their fury. This morning, help us in the times of fires in California to trust in your mercy, which never ends, and your power, which in Jesus Christ stilled the storms and raised the dead. We pray this morning for all who are in harm's way with the fires, for their homes, for their lives and their families. We pray for firefighters and first responders, hotshot crews, pilots, utility workers and police, for the Red Cross and all the emergency workers and staff who are setting up shelters for evacuees, who are feeding and setting up camps for firefighters and providing ways for people to find their loved ones and to be reunited. Grant them strength and purpose and concern for others. And may we be a neighbor for them and share your love. Lord, as the political parties hold their conventions this month and the presidential election and the rhetoric heats up, we pray that you keep this nation in your care. Bless the leaders of our land, whatever party, Restore in us a sense of the value and the purpose of our own voices as we prepare to vote. May we renew our sense of citizenship for this nation, that it might bless the other nations of the earth. Gracious God, hold in your care those who are grieving the death of a family member or a loved one. Guide them through their grief that it becomes woven into their lives, a part of their story, not as a burden they feel they must carry forever, but a song. We pray for all those who've been hospitalized this week, who are struggling with chronic illness, who are waiting for medication to arrive in the mail, who are hoping for a phone call from a friend or a family member. Be with those who feel isolated and alone. Restore our sense of community with each other, even in a virtual world in which we live. Help us to pick up the phone, send an email, and share our love with those who may be craving to have some kind of human contact. Lord, in all things, we pray this, as well as all the concerns lifted up to you today. In the name of him, our Savior Christ, who taught us to be bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's listen together our final hymn. It's a hymn 
a song of sending. now receive this blessing. May the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God our Creator and our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
to those who lived it and my part in it. So it was all a little overwhelming. Would you call Penny and have her sit with you? <laughs> Wayne just walked by. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help laughing. 